Go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22, please. At page 1539 in the church Bibles here, Matthew chapter 22. And our passage uh, today is from verses 41 to 46. Uh, Matthew 22, verses 41 through 46, page 1539 here in the church Bibles. By the way, this is uh, message number 100 in our study through the Gospel of Matthew. Lord's been teaching us a lot of truths through this book, and uh, we're fast uh, coming to the end of this book. And what a fitting passage today, a passage that declares the truth that Jesus is not only a man, but is also the Lord of all things. We're going to read the text, pray, and take a closer look at the sermon that I've titled as Jesus, not only a man, but also the Lord. Matthew 21, 22, beginning in verse 41. When the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how then? How can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply, and from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful that in your mercy, you have given us your word. And the word today that is in front of us, such a rich passage, I pray that your spirit will help us to see the person of Christ in a more clearer way. Increase our understanding. Open our eyes to see the wonderful truths. Illumine our hearts so that as we learn these truths, your spirit also will work in us to reflect on the implications of this text in our individual lives. We need your spirit to help us to see the glories of Christ. As we see the text, we see the face of Christ. So help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, one of the main purposes which I've been reminding us of, of Matthew writing this gospel, was to convince his own people, the Jews, with the good news that uh, this Jesus, he is the Messiah, the King and Deliverer, promised by God in the Old Testament. In fact, this becomes very clear in the very first verse of Matthew's Gospel. If you remember, we started Matthew with just that one verse, Matthew 1 and verse 1, where uh, uh, Matthew tells us, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then he unpacks the implications of that for the rest of this Gospel. That word Messiah, it's a Hebrew word. The Greek equivalent is Christ. And both mean the same, anointed one. Anointed one. Why does Matthew introduce Jesus in this way? Because the Jews were aware in the Old Testament, from the Old Testament scriptures, that the Messiah, this this, this Christ, would come in the line of David as well as in the line of Abraham. He's the one that's the promised king to come and set up God's rule on earth. And that is why if you notice in in, in this gospel, chapter after chapter, Matthew quotes scripture from the Old Testament as to how Jesus not only came from Abraham's line and David's line, but he was the fulfillment of so many other scriptures in the Old Testament that pointed to the Messiah. In fact, no other gospel has so many Old Testament references as Matthew because that's Matthew's focus to present to the nation. This is the promised king. Embrace him. Bow down to his authority. And nearly 22 chapters later, we find Jesus on his final week on earth. And in his confrontation with these religious leaders that's been going on for the last few chapters now, he himself makes yet another assertion that he is the promised Messiah. You see, the common opinion of the day was the Messiah was just a mere man. A mere man that God would send 
to deliver the nation from its enemies and establish God's kingdom on earth. But Jesus made it very clear, and you're gonna see that in this passage, that he's not just a mere man, not just a mere king, but he is also the Lord of all. In other words, he's talking about his divine nature in addition to his human nature. And by doing that, he's exposing the inadequacy of these religious leaders that they're really not qualified teachers. That's why he called them in the next chapter, chapter 23 and verse 16, as blind guides. Blind guides who fail to see the true nature of the Messiah. In the next chapter, he would condemn them for not only failing to understand his true identity, despite seeing sign after sign and miracle after miracle that pointed to who he is. Not only did they fail to see it, but they were actively opposing him. And the end result condemnation, condemnation. And in this last week, especially we see how these religious authorities, their opposition to Jesus was reaching to a new high. But we also see during these times of confrontation, Jesus also, once again, by his works and by his words, clearly revealing his identity as the God sent Messiah. Let's recap a little bit from the day Jesus entered Jerusalem. And in chapter 21, we see that's often called Palm Sunday. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a young donkey. And then and, and we, we find uh, on that Sunday, Zechariah 9.9 is quoted as Jesus enters on a young donkey. That's to fulfill Zechariah 9.9 that says the Messiah would come in that manner. And then on Monday, on Monday, He's back to Jerusalem because in the nights he was staying in Bethany about a couple of kilometers from Jerusalem. He surveys the temple when he comes Sunday. He goes back, spends probably most likely in uh, uh, Mary, Martha and Lazarus' home in Bethany. And then Monday morning, he comes back into towards Jerusalem. As he comes, he curses the fig tree and then cleanses the temple. Mark puts the chronology uh, better. Both those signs are to indicate that the nation is under judgment. Israel was considered the fig tree in the Old Testament, but they didn't bear fruit. And the temple, the Messiah has the authority to cleanse the temple, Malachi 4. We, we looked at all those in details. He does that again showing he is the Messiah. Not only that, in the temple, he was healing the blind and the lame. So he's saying that there is no more prohibition. The blind could not enter the temple, but they hear the Messiah is there and he heals them. And by the way, if you read the Old Testament and the New Testament, no one but Jesus heals the blind. It's almost like it's exclusively that was a ministry of the Messiah. Isaiah 35 verses 5 and 6 says when the Messiah comes, one of the things that he would do is he will heal the blind, give sight to the blind. And then if you look at verses, chapter 21, verse 23, a key verse. Jesus enters the temple courts. This is now... Tuesday. He's confronted by the religious leaders. While he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the temple came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked, and who gave you this authority? So Jesus would give three parables, and through that he will teach them again and again. My authority comes from heaven because I am the God sent Messiah. And now, in this passage, we're going to see. He's going to make that even more clear. From this time on, the religious leaders don't ask him any questions. And the religious leaders, as he teaches them through parables, they understand very clearly. The text says that. If you look at verse 45 of chapter 21, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, plural, all three parables that went ahead, they knew he was talking about them, yet you would think they humbled themselves and embraced him. No. Yet, they were trying to find a way to arrest him. So they're settled in their opposition. But yet the loving Savior, once again, as he's been using scripture after scripture after scripture to base his answers for the questions they're throwing at him, once again, reveals his identity. And the last trap they laid was, his, was in verses 34 through 36. They Verse 35 says, one of the religious leaders 
tested him with this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? We took three weeks to look at that. The first one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, meaning love him with all your being. Nothing can hinder you from loving him. And then we looked last time in Matthew, love your neighbor as yourself. As yourself. And as, as usual, his answers were drawn from the Old Testament scriptures. But then comes a turn of events. Instead of the leaders asking Jesus questions, notice Jesus goes on the offensive. Verse 41, that's where we pick up today's story. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, He's asking them this important question. What do you think about the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one? Whose son is he? Now notice, without any hesitation, they give the answer, instant answer, the son of David, they replied. The son of David. Now where did they get this from? Obviously the Old Testament scriptures. And we've seen many of those scriptures in the past. But let me refresh your memory one more time as to how the Old Testament clearly talks about the Messiah, this king, this God-appointed deliverer would come from the line of David. You can follow along with me or you can just listen to them. There's many passages, but I'm going to look at just a handful. The first one we're going to look at is 2 Samuel chapter 7. It's page 478 in the church Bibles here or just follow along with me. Here's God giving a promise to David. King David. And this is what God says in verses 12 and 13. When your days are over, David, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Then verse 16, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now some of these were fulfilled in Solomon's time when he built this physical temple and in Solomon's time there was the United Kingdom there and the kingdom flourished. There was no wars. Everything was fine but that was not a complete fulfillment there. This is points to the greater David. The physical, through the physical line of David this God appointed Messiah who would come. Jesus Christ himself. Notice it says your kingdom will endure forever before me, David. Your throne will be established forever. All these human kings came and went. Judah had 21 kings after, uh, when you start when the kingdom was divided. Only nine were righteous. Rest were unrighteous. As far as Israel, all of them unrighteous. So the kingdom never was forever. But when Jesus comes, they knew. We're looking for someone. And the Jews were very particular, by the way. If someone claimed to be Messiah, one of the first things they would do was to make sure establish the lineage. Is there a clear track there going back to David? Psalm 132, verse 11, page 970. And here's the psalmist saying, The Lord swore an oath to David, a sure oath he will not revoke. This is way past Solomon's time, by the way. One of your own descendants I will place on your throne. Again, the promise was given to David, one of your own descendants, one of your own flesh and blood. And then that very familiar passage that is read during Christmas time, Isaiah chapter 9, page 1073. Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7. Let's look at this with a fresh insight here. For to us, the nation is saying this, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Looking forward to the time when Christ returns, that's when this will be fulfilled. You know, people read Isaiah 9 during Christmas time, but that's not yet fully fulfilled. The Messiah came, but when he comes back again, that's when you see this forever. Forever. Certain things initiated at Jesus' first coming. The complete fulfillment awaits his second coming. And then one more passage, and we're going to stop with that. Jeremiah 23, page 1213. You're in Isaiah, the next book. 
Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, God's contrasting all these false shepherds, true shepherds. Same thing that he does later in Ezekiel 34, Ezekiel 37, which I'm not going to look at. But look at in Jeremiah 23. How clear it is. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David, very specific, a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. So the people that Jesus was talking to on that day, they're very familiar with all these passages. They were anticipating this Messiah to come, especially the anticipation was high in the first century because of Rome's oppression. They're anticipating. So Jesus, so Jesus clearly is talking to people who are well informed from the Old Testament scriptures. That's why the instant answer was the Messiah would be the son of David. That's why Matthew in the very first chapter verses 1 through 17 establishes the genealogy of Dave, of Jesus. He goes all the way back to Abraham because his focus is on the Jewish nation. Luke's focus is a little different. That's why in his genealogy, he goes all the way back to Adam. All the way back to Adam in Luke chapter 3. And the leaders did not dispute that Jesus was a descendant of David. If not, they would have told him right away. They didn't dispute that. In fact, even the crowds, it's interesting, even the crowds Recognize Jesus as being the son of David. You're in Matthew 22. Go back to chapter 20 for a moment. Chapter 20. Look at verses 30 and 31. Uh, Pierre last week alluded to this. These blind people were going into uh, Jerusalem. And uh, uh, the, Jesus is going to Jerusalem. You got these two blind men. Notice in verse 30 and 31 how they describe Jesus. Lord. What did they say next? Son of David. Son of David, have mercy on us. And then he enters Jerusalem. And how's, how are the crowds greeting him? Verse 9. Hosanna. To whom? To the son of David. And then if you look at chapter 21, verse 15, Jesus is in the temple. Now you got little children. And what are they saying? Hosanna to the son of David. That's what angers the religious leaders even more. So you got blind people, keep that in mind, recognizing his identity. You had the crowds recognizing his identity, little children recognizing his identity, probably they're caught up with what the crowds are saying. But you got these religious leaders, eyes wide open, with scripture knowledge, even though it was limited, scripture knowledge, were opposing him. Don't forget the contrast here. Don't forget the contrast. But the crowd, and the blind people, all of these who recognized Jesus as son of David, as the Messiah, they were still limited in their understanding. The general thought was this Messiah was a human being, but a human being would be a triumphant warrior king and no more. That's it, no more. Nothing beyond a human being. They didn't recognize that he's also God in flesh. They didn't have that clear understanding. And that's the thinking Jesus seeks to correct and in that process exposes the inadequacy of these religious leaders and then pronounces condemnation on them, all of chapter 23. Look at verse, verses 43 through 45 of Matthew 22. So as soon as they say the son of David, notice what Jesus tells them. How is it then David speaking by the Spirit calls him Lord. For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how then can he be his son? One of the most important passages in the gospel, all the gospel accounts, where Jesus himself affirms his deity. Mark and Luke also have a record of this passage. So it's an important passage. Let's pay close attention. You have to stick with me because I want you to see the connection between here and we're going to go to Psalm 110 verse 1 in a moment because that's exactly what Jesus is quoting here in verse 44. But notice first of all what Jesus is saying here in verse 43. He established the, the fact that what he's going to quote, the Psalm 110 verse 1 that David wrote, was not something David came up with on his own. 
That is what he says. David, speaking by the Spirit. Speaking by the Spirit. So these are not mere man's words. These are divinely given words to us. They cannot be ignored. They must be taken seriously. After establishing that, then look at the question he poses to them. How is it then that David, speaking by the Lord, calls him Lord? It's clear that David calls his Messiah, that's the him, as Lord. That term Lord can be a title of a person of superiority, like Sir or Master. But it can also refer to the Old Testament word Lord, all capitals, or Yahweh, the proper name for God. In the New Testament, we often see this as a reference to the Son of God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. But how can we say for sure the term Lord does not refer to a mere human being, someone who's of position and authority, but it actually refer, refers to a divine being? That's verse 44. Let us stuff it. It's a reference, as I said, to Psalm 110 and goes on from there. So, by the way, Psalm 110 is one of the most quoted Old Testament passages in the New Testament. It talks later about Melchizedek and all that. So let's go back to Psalm 110. Let's look at this psalm in its original setting, page 951. In page 951, you have here, we have here this psalm, it's a psalm of David. Look at the first part of Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord that Jesus says there, sit at my, let's, let's look at just the first part, the Lord says to my Lord, because that's, that's very important. Now I want you to notice something. There's two Lords described there. But if you notice, the first Lord is in caps, capital letters, L-O-R-D. Look at the second Lord. It's... Smaller wording, L-O-R-D. The footnote says it could be a capital L and then O-R-D in the lower caps. In the Hebrew language, the first Lord, L-O-R-D, all capitals, it's consonants, Y-H-W-H, often called as Yahweh. Yahweh, which is the name of the one true God. The first time God reveals this name is in Exodus 3.15. Moses goes to this burning bush and God calls Moses, you know, uh, you're going to be the deliverer. I'm going to send you. So God says, this is how you are to introduce me. He talks about I am. Then also in verse 15, he says, the Lord. It's a covenant name. The use of the name implies a kind of a personal covenant relationship that Yahweh had with his people at that time, the nation of Israel. So God reveals himself as the Lord, L O R D. All capitals. But now notice the second Lord, the lower case. It is different. In the Hebrew language, that word refers to the term Adonai. Adonai. It's, it's kind of a title there. It has the idea of someone being all-powerful, sovereign, in absolute control, in charge. Now it's clear from Psalm 110, and verse 1, there's two individuals that are described here. There's the first one, Lord, Yahweh, speaking to a second person, Adonai, sovereign one. And the Jews did not dispute that. They looked at this sovereign one as the Messiah. But they did not recognize this second one as a divine being. But the very same psalm inevitably says that this person is also a divine being. How so? Stick with me. Stick with me, it's very important. Look at what follows the rest of verse one. Sit at my right hand. This is Yahweh telling this Messiah, the sovereign one, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Jesus in Matthew 22 talks about until I put your enemies under your feet. Slight variation, but the idea is still the same. Idea is still the same. It's a promise from Yahweh to the second person, the Messiah, that his enemies will be made subject to him. You're the sovereign one. But the main phrase I want you to notice is sit at my right hand. Sitting at the right hand indicates not just a place of power, authority, 
but also of equality. That's very important. Sometimes we people hear, that's my right-hand guy. The right-hand person, it's, it's a place of honor, a place of authority. Hey, that person represents me. But here, for Yahweh, for the one true God, to share that, he cannot do that to a lesser being. He cannot do that. My glory, I will not give to another. And since the Jews never had an issue that this psalm pointed to the Messiah and they never had an issue that this was divinely inspired, they cannot really disagree that the Messiah is also a divine person. But the religious leaders, they were blind, blind guides. And the crowd, crowds were just following them. And David is calling this Lord as my Lord. This clearly meant that the person David addressing here was already in existence. If not, he would say, the Lord would say to my Lord, the son that's going to come out of my line. He's talking about the Lord says to my Lord, which means the second person is already in existence. So that has got to be someone who's not a mere human being because David's son is yet to be born. The son who will claim this kingship. So it's a being already in existence, the son that this is pointing to, the ultimate, ultimate seed, Jesus himself. Because they knew it's not Solomon. It's a thousand years later this is happening. Could not have referred to Solomon. It has to refer to someone who existed during David's time, but who would also eventually come in David's line as one of his descendants. So it's clear there. It's clear there. Now back to Matthew 22. In case you lost your place there, it's page 1539. Back to Matthew 22. So Jesus goes to Psalm 110, quotes Psalm 110, verse 1, and then he poses this question to them, verse 45. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? Meaning, how can you Jews, you religious leaders, say that the Messiah, the son of David, is no more than a mere man when David, writing under the Holy Spirit's influence, clearly referred to this Messiah as a divine person. You see, there's a quandary there. The son was yet to be born. Who is Yahweh talking to? Who's already in existence? And that's the person you believe is the Messiah. So, can that Messiah just be a mere man? It cannot be. He wanted to show these religious leaders their limited understanding. Or as D.A. Carson puts it, they had a very simplistic view of the true nature of the Messiah. They needed to understand that this is not just a mere man that they're opposing. You're plotting to kill me. You're plotting to trap me. But do you understand who I really am. All these works that I've been doing, all these words that I've been saying, and all these Old Testament scriptures that I've been fulfilling so far in my ministry, don't you get it? All these point to me, not just being a mere man, but equal to the Father in essence, coming here to deliver you. You need to bow down to me. You need to bow down to me. This is where I'm getting my authority from goes back to that question in Matthew 21, verse 23. What authority are you doing this? I'm doing this on the authority of I am your creator. I'm your maker. You're opposing your maker. And that's why he will pronounce judgment upon them in the next chapter for rejecting this clear truth. Here's the embodiment of truth staring at them. Staring at them. But they willfully remained in blindness. They refused to turn. That's why you find verse 46. No one could say a word in reply and from that day on no one dared to ask him any more questions. How can they, how can they refuse his words? Because if they refuse his words, then they have to say David was wrong. You can't say David is wrong because David writes under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So when they don't have an answer, they don't want to admit they are wrong, they keep silent. They keep silent. Now you see why Jesus quoted Psalm 110 verse 1. 
the wisdom of our Lord. Yes, he is pronouncing condemnation on them. Yet, don't forget the compassion. Once again, he's revealing his identity to them. Once again, he's calling them. See me for who I am. See me for who I am. Stop opposing me. Stop opposing me. You're not opposing a mere man here. You're fighting against God himself. Stop it. You need to have a higher view of who I am. I am both the son of man and the son of God. Didn't you hear the voice of the baptism? And Jesus himself talked about himself being the son of man. Going back to Daniel 7. This is the son of man. This is the Messiah. God sent deliverer. Rich truths about the person of Jesus in this passage. Not only a man, but also the Lord. And that calls for humility. All humanity in humility must sub submit to his authority. That's his whole picture of Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. Right hand again pictures authority. Here I am doing all these things based on this authority. I am a divine son of God. Full of pride. Refuse to humble themselves. And the result, we're going to look at in verse chapter 23, but just for today, I want you to look at verse 33 of chapter 23. Verse 23. For people not to acknowledge Jesus for who he is and submit to his authority, this is, this is the end result. You snakes, he calls them. You brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? How will you escape? You oppose me. Now you may say, well, I'm not like the religious leaders trying to kill Jesus. I'm still not sure about Jesus. I'm still waiting to repent. By that, you've actually made a decision. You're telling, I'm comfortable with being condemned to hell. Jesus says there is no escaping this for those who resist his authority. And that's a tragic end because that's for all eternity. We can make poor choices in our earthly life and we, a lot of times we do. We do. And at best, at best there might be temporary consequences or at worst for the rest of our earthly life. But beyond that, there's no concerns for the believer. But this has eternal consequences. Eternal consequences. These religious leaders heard Jesus multiple times, saw multiple times. You may say, well, I'm not seeing any miracles. The very fact you're breathing is a miracle. If you're far away from Christ, because he has no obligation to give you life, but he gives you life, he gives you clothes, he gives you food, he gives you health, he gives you everything. And what are you doing? Taking that and throwing back at his face and saying, I live life on my own terms. How can you escape, Jesus says. How will you escape being condemned to hell? So if, if you have never turned from your sins, if you have never turned to this Jesus, this King of the universe, this Lord of all, if you've never accepted the forgiveness he offers, Hebrews 1.3 says, after he made purification for sins, he sat at the right hand of the Father. Again, that talks about Jesus paying the full price for sins. If you've never turned to this Jesus, today is the day. This is not a suggestion. Jesus is not sitting and pleading with you or suggesting, think about this. Jesus is commanding you to repent to turn from your own ways, to turn from you being the boss of your life and to turn to him and bow at his feet and plead for mercy. Acknowledge you have sinned. You have opposed him all your life. Acknowledge to him. It's never too late. Never too late. Acknowledge to him. Lord, give me a new heart. Give me a spirit of repentance. Give me the faith to turn to you. All you have to do is cry from your heart. Don't postpone. Don't postpone. That's what coming under his authority begins with. But if you refuse, how can you escape such a 
condemnation, being condemned to hell. I promise you, if you truly cry out from your heart, there is no formula, folks. Just calling upon the Lord. From your heart. If you cry out, if it's a spirit-prompted cry, I promise you, He will forgive you no matter how much you have sinned. He will wash all your sins away because the blood of Christ has that power to wash all your sins, past, present, and future. He will give you a new heart and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who will come and live inside you forever. He works from you on the outside then He works from you from within. So please don't delay. Come today. Become a new person. Become a new person. And for those, those of us in whose life this work has already been done, Jesus has already worked in our hearts, made us call out to him, give, give us a spirit of repentance and faith and the Holy Spirit. We are to continue living under his authority as well. That's important. We don't enter through the narrow gate and then live on the broad road. It's narrow entrance. Narrow is the road that leads to life. The broad road is very close by. Sometimes we find ourselves one foot there, one foot here. I understand that we all struggle with sin. And that's why when we struggle, those commands that are hard for our flesh to submit to, we must again understand, this is not a mere man calling us to follow him. This is the king. The king who gave his life on that cross. We sang earlier, beautiful songs, beautiful songs. Uh, thank you for that music ministry. So we, we sang those songs that exalts the king, that exalts his mercy. So we go back again and again and again and say, I have a hard time, Lord. I have a hard time. I can't let go of this idol or I can't let go of that lust or I can't, I, I can't come to grips with the forgiving my enemies. But what does, what's the promise here? Sit at my feet until I put your enemies in subjection to you. Today, people cannot attack Jesus directly. So who will they attack? You and me. But what's the call? Retaliate? No, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord, Romans 12. Leave it in God's hands. Leave room. Leave a place for God's wrath. On the contrary, you give food to the one who's hungry. You give water to the one who's thirsty. Overcome evil with good. First Peter 3, 9. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay insult with good. For to this you were called. It's this lifestyle you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. People say, I want God's blessing. Well, here's the key. Repay evil with good. We can be assured God will one day deal with all that is wrong in this universe. But on our part, be merciful as your Heavenly Father is merciful. Don't love the world. It's fading away. Whoever does the will of God abides forever. First John 2, 17. So when we have those struggles, we go back to Him. We acknowledge, I'm wrong. Wash me again, Lord. Cleanse me. Give me the strength to obey. Help me to hate that sin. Sometimes you look at, but I'm enjoying my sin. I don't even feel like I should be convicted more. That's okay. We can go with that and even acknowledge that to me. He already knows. We can tell him, Lord, I don't even feel like giving up this sin because it feels so good. But produce in me a spirit because your word says it is wrong. My flesh is blinding me. Open my eyes deeper. Help me. Help me. He will give the help. Even if you cannot overcome it today, keep on asking, keep on praying. He will help you hate that sin that so clings to you now. We're told in Romans 8 and verse 34, what a beautiful statement. Romans 8, 34, that Paul is talking about who can lay a charge against us, who can condemn us. We have the Son of God who died, rose again, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. What is Christ doing there? Interceding for us. We would not need any intercession if we were not sinners. Think about it. 
Once you become a Christian, if you're never going to sin, then why should Jesus have to intercede on our behalf? That's what theologians call as the unfinished work of Christ. There's a finished work on the cross, but there's an unfinished work going on in heaven on our behalf. He's interceding for us, his people, specific there. That's because Jesus knows, even before he saved us, that we would sin. We look at, how could I have done this? It catches us by surprise and should. It shows us how depraved we really are and the power of sin. But despite knowing that if Christ has saved us, how much more is his love for us? And that love he shows to us should motivate us to love him back. And that love should motivate us to hate that sin. Love for Christ, as we reflect on his love for us, empowers us to hate and loathe that sin that we love today. Jesus knows we are imperfect people. How comforting is that? How comforting is that? This is not a license to live in sin, obviously, because we have to live under his authority, but this is also very comforting. I'll tell you something. The, holy, the devil is called as the accuser because he brings a charge to condemn us. The Holy Spirit convicts us so that we will turn. There's a difference. Condemnation versus conviction. Holy Spirit convicts us so that we can go back to Christ, get cleansed, get back on track. The accuser accuses us to cut us off. Sometimes we forget that and by faith, we must keep on believing. My Christ loves me. He's going to give me the strength. It's not by works now I can finish this journey. It's a journey from beginning to end by faith. Romans 1.17 By faith. there's true confession, whenever there's true confession, true desire to repent, there is a cleansing. There's a cleansing. Don't, don't blame others. Clean confession. I have sinned against you. Take sides with God against your sin, against yourself. That's what David did. You are just God in Psalm 51, in everything you do. You're just. He goes to the other side of the room, takes side with God against himself. That's what we should do in our confession. I, it's my, I'm, I've sinned. That doesn't excuse others of their sin, but this way we identify with our sin so much. Now we're opening the channel of cleansing and empowering more and more. But that takes humility, doesn't it? I mean, think about it at the end of the day. It's all about humility. The religious leaders in their pride would not submit to Jesus. And if we don't submit to Jesus in our daily lives, how different are we? Are we fooling ourselves? Are we so convinced because we come to church, because we're in, even involved in ministry, and we could even be standing here as a pastor or as a preacher, preaching God's word, that I'm exempt? How foolish of me. How terrible to be deceived. So we need to ask God constantly, open my eyes, open my eyes, to see who you are, to see who I am. Humility. Or well, the choices we choose to remain in our pride and live life on our own terms. I, I pray, I genuinely pray, that the Lord will produce in us a deeper humility so we submit more and more to His authority over our lives because the alternative is tragic, eternal suffering in hell. Don't delay. No matter how much you have sinned, come to Him. Flee from the wrath that is to come. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for, in just one verse, how much truth you have packed and revealed to us. No wonder the scriptures describe your word as a powerful word, living and active, cutting deep. Thank you. Thank you for your love and compassion to us, even to these wicked leaders. Even in the next chapter, as we will see, while you pronounced condemnation for those who reject you, at the end of the chapter, you are also weeping for Jerusalem. 
Oh Lord, give us that kind of a heart to weep for our enemies. To weep for them, not just telling them the seriousness of sin and judgment, but also weeping. How often we are caught up with a retaliatory spirit rather than weeping for sinners. Lord, we cannot do this on our own. We cannot manufacture this kind of a heart. We again need a deeper work from your spirit. As the word went in today, and even as we participate in the table and reminded of your great sacrifice, may your word continue to go inside of us. The instrument that the spirit uses, the weapon the Holy Spirit uses, Pray that your spirit will use this weapon mightily so that we would have a deep conviction whether we are far away from you or whether we are your followers, Lord, to live a life that clearly shows you are our king. You're not just a mere man, but the divine son of God himself. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your continual intercession. Thank you. As you've promised, you will come. All will be well. Until then, Help us to keep looking to you. Our eyes, help our eyes to be lifted up to you until you display that final, full and final mercy when we are with you. Please hear our prayers. If anyone is far away here, please, I plead with you, save them. Bring them to yourself, Lord. And if anyone is struggling in sin as your follower, Give them deliverance too by looking to you and to your love, allowing them to trust in you by faith to bring forth the deliverance in your time. Thank you. Thank you for this time so far today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.